Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I'll be your reader today. February is a special month for a certain group of folks in our wonderful town of Camden, Maine, and that is the Camden Garden Club. And February Camden Garden Club's 2022 Winter Horticulture Series, which includes a wonderful series of lectures every Tuesday morning uh, as we prepare for spring. Let us be hopeful anyway. Uh, so today's reading has been selected specifically to join hands with the Camden um, Garden Club uh, and their highly, highly informative winter series. So I salute you, Camden Garden Club, um, and uh, I look forward to going to more of your uh, series lectures. They're fabulous. Let me start with a quote today and use your imagination on this one. This one takes a little more imagination, I think, than some of my other quotes. Picture a single imaginary plant bearing throughout one season of May to October, all of the different vegetables we harvest. We'll call it a vegetannual, <laughs> a vegetannual. That is a quote that is on the first page of the book I'm going to read to you today. And I think it's just great for the imagination. One single plant that would just absolutely grow everything and grow it from May to October, whatever's supposed to be in May, et cetera. So the idea of it, of course, is quite fabulous. I've actually decided to plant my first small box garden on my balcony this springtime. Now, don't, don't uh, underestimate, this is a major decision. And why so? Because I have no experience whatsoever with vegetables, plants, or flowers. And I've been known to be so over nurturing as to kill a cactus. So with those thoughts in mind, uh, I figure how difficult can it be to grow herbs, tomatoes, spinach, and artichoke hearts Provençal. <laughs> Maybe I'm dreaming. <laughs> so there is hope, there is hope. And as a dedicated classicist, I feel sure that the Greek gods of harvest will come to my aid. Let's see how many of these you know. Cronus, Cronus, the titan of time and harvest. Sibylle, the Phrygian goddess of the fertile earth and wild animals. Demeter, goddess of the harvest, crops, the fertility of the earth, grains, and seasons. I have three of them on my shoulders here to help me out. And if it gets terribly frustrating and a bit of a failure, then I do still have my friend Dionysus and Dionysus being the god of wine, but also vegetation, pleasure, madness, and festivity. So if all goes wrong, I'll just have a glass of wine. <laughs> Once again, the quote, picture a single imaginary plant bearing throughout one season of May to October, all the different vegetables we harvest. We'll call it a vegetannual. <laughs> With that quote, thus begins the launch of today's book, Animal, Vegetable, Miracle, A Year of Food Life by the forever popular writer, Barbara Kingsolver. But before exploring the book, let's consider some facts about the author. Barbara Kingsolver is a, quote, contemporary U.S. author of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, critical commentary, and journalism. That's quite a few guns in her holster. 
Miss King saw this journey began in 1955 in Annapolis, Maryland, but already by age two, she was on the move exploring America and the world <laughs> with a family move to rural East Central Kentucky. She quotes, I'm lucky to have grown up in the midst of pastures and woodlands with parents who favored virtually any form of reading as educational, from classic comic books to the Encyclopedia Britannica. And read she did with verve and vitality. A little bit later in 1963, she and her family lived in the Republic of Congo, which at eight years old opened Barbara's big observant eyes to the big world beyond. She quotes again, at age eight, I began keeping a journal inspired by the gift of a small red diary with a tiny lock. The lock was gratuitous, given the diary's soporific content, but the ruled lines encouraged a habit of daily writing. When my school teachers assigned a two-page theme, they would get 10 pages from me, a surfeit of juvenile prose I am sure they came to dread. I could hardly contain my adjectives. I entered every school essay contest that presented itself, and my first published work entitled Why We Need a New Elementary School gave an exciting account of how our grade school ceiling plaster fell and injured my teacher. My essay was printed in the Nelco newspaper prior to a school board meeting and bond election, and the school bond passed. I had no notion of ever becoming a writer then. Evidence suggested that writers were old from England and uniformly dead. But I, I credit that school bond incident for teaching me that the pencil is a mighty tool, end of quote. <laughs> Barbara graduated from DePauw University in Indiana in 1977 on a piano scholarship, but throughout her college years, she nurtured a private passion for writing. But she says to claim author as a professional ambition would have seemed starry-eyed to me in the same category with concert pianist, movie star, and people who can fly, end quote. <laughs> After graduation, she goes on to say, I bought a cheap one-way ticket to Europe to seek my fortune. I continued to support myself by any means available, working mostly on archeological digs in France and England. By the time my work visa expired, I had accumulated notebooks full of poems and stories, but no noticeable fortune. In 1978, with feet back on terra firma USA, Barbara moved to Tucson, Arizona, quote, out of curiosity to see the West. And this is where today's book, In the Spotlight, begins 26 years later in 2004. However, the road less traveled by in those 26 years joyfully held many highlights. The publishing of her first novel, The Bean Trees in 1988, a year away from the American Southwest in the Canary Islands, Tel Aviv, with her husband, Joe, and four-year-old daughter, Camille, where she researched an, quote, embryonic African project, end quote, published her fifth novel and her first poetry collection called Another America. In 1993, she published her sixth novel, Pigs in Heaven, the first to hit the New York Times bestseller list. She established the Bellwether Prize, which is awarded biannually uh, to first time novelist. 
In the decade before leaving Tucson in 2004, Barbara was awarded a National Humanities Medal in 2000, successfully published five more books and relished having one of them, the Poison Wood Bible, selected by Oprah Winfrey for her book club. Barbara Kingsolver's major works include eight novels, three books of nonfiction, two books of short stories, two of essays, one of poetry, and her last book in 2020, How to Fly in 10,000 Easy Lessons, which she claims is a book of poetry offering reflections on the practical, the spiritual, and the wild. In 2020, Barbara King Solver wrote, at the dawn of another new decade, I'm comfortable with my unusual position in the universe. A literary writer trained as a biologist and a rural agrarian advocate working in an overwhelmingly urban-based, urban representative field. Living in the red end of a blue state, working with both my head and my hands, devoted to science, faith, family, tradition, and progressive social change, I try to be a useful ambassador between disparate worlds. I hope to spend the rest of my days in this old farmhouse at the foot of a mountain where we raise Icelandic sheep, poultry, and an enormous vegetable garden. <laughs> Animal vegetable miracle, a year of food life. This experiential delight of a book was first published in 2007 and expanded for the 10th anniversary edition in 2017 with chapters written by Barbara, of course, her husband, Stephen, and both of her daughters, Camille and Lily. And one final quote from the publisher, with characteristic poetry and pluck, Barbara Kingsolva and her family sweep readers along the first year of their journey away from the industrial food pipeline to a rural life in which they vow to buy only food raised in their own neighborhood, grow it themselves, or learn to live without it. <laughs> so we have this marvelous book, um, which I, I just think it captivates me because it captures the whim that all of us have at some point in life, I think, of just taking a year out of life, whatever life, journey we're on and doing something that requires a sense of courage and wants you to avoid having any regrets at age 90 in a rocking chair on a main porch overlooking the ocean. I wish I had done that. Gosh, sad words. So here's a year that led to a lifetime. <laughs> I don't want to give away too much, but so I'm going to start at the beginning uh, as a place to start, I guess. Uh, and I've sort of pieced together about 20 minutes of her first long chapter. And then believe it or not, I'll tell you the chapter titles just to get you enticed. And then I'm going to skip to the end to the find, uh, did it work? It's not such a dramatic uh, a novel that you'll find out who died and who married and who lived forever after. Uh, but I do want to read some of her very humorous evaluation of that year. So we'll start at the beginning, which is, is called, the title is Called Home. Uh, remember, her, well, you don't know, her, her husband, Stephen, uh, grew up in this uh, Appalachia area. And as I mentioned earlier, she had a section of her life in Kentucky. So that is what is meant by Called Home. Let's see where we go with Barbara. This story about good food begins in a quick shop convenience market. 
It was our family's last day in Arizona where I'd lived half my life and raised two kids for the whole of theirs. Now we were moving away forever, taking our nostalgic inventory of the things we would never see again. The bush where the roadrunner built a nest and fed lizards to her weird looking babies. The tree Camille crashed into learning to ride a bike. The exact spot where Lily touched a dead snake. Our driveway was just the first tributary on a memory river sweeping us out. One person's picture postcard is someone else's normal. This was the landscape whose every face we knew. Giant saguaro cacti, coyotes, mountains, the wicked sun reflecting off bare gravel. We were leaving it now in one of its uglier moments, which made goodbye easier, but also seemed like a cheap shot, like ending a romance right when your partner has really bad bed hair. The desert that day looked like a nasty case of prickly heat caught in a long naked wince. This was the end of May. Our rainfall since Thanksgiving had measured less than one inch. The cacti, denizens of deprivation, looked ready to pull up roots and hitch a ride out if they could. The prickly pears waved goodbye with puckered grayish pads. The tall dehydrated saguaros stood around all teetery and sucked in like very prickly supermodels. Even in the best of times, desert creatures live on the edge of survival, getting by mostly on vapor and their own life savings. Now, as the southern tier of the US states came into a third consecutive year of drought, people elsewhere debated how seriously they should take global warming. We were staring it in the face. Away went our little family like rats leaping off the burning ship. It hurt to think about everything at once, our friends, our desert, our home, old home, new home. We felt giddy and tragic as we pulled up at a little gas and go market on the outside edge of Tucson. Before we set up to seek our fortunes, we had to gas up of course, and buy snacks for the road. We did have a cooler in the back seat packed with respectable lunch fare, but we had more than 2000 miles to go. Before we crossed a few state lines, we'd need to give our car a salt treatment and indulge in some things that go crunch. This was the trip of our lives. We were ending our existence outside the city limits of Tucson, Arizona to begin our rural one in Southern Appalachia. We'd sold our house and, our house and stuffed the car with the most crucial things, birth certificates, books on tape, and a dog on drugs, just for the trip, I assure you. All other stuff would come in the moving van. For better or worse, we would soon be living on a farm. For 20 years, Stephen had owned a piece of land in the Southern Appalachians with a farmhouse, barn, orchards and fields, and a tax zoning known as farm use. He was living there when I met him, teaching college and fixing up his old house, one salvaged window at a time. I'd come on a visiting writer stint, recently divorced with something of a fixer upper life. We proceeded to wreck our agendas in the predictable fashion by falling in love. My young daughter and I were attached to our community in Tucson. Stephen was just as attached to his own green pastures and the birdsong chorus of deciduous Eastern woodlands. My father-in-law-to-be, upon hearing the exacting and exciting news about us, asked Stephen, couldn't you find one closer? Apparently not. 
We held on to the farm by renting the farmhouse to another family and maintained marital happiness by migrating like birds. For the school year, we lived in Tucson, but every summer headed back to our rich foraging grounds, the farm. For three months a year, we lived in a tiny, extremely crooked log cabin in the woods behind the farmhouse, listened to wood thrushes growing our own food. The girls, for another child came along shortly, loved playing in the creek, catching turtles, experiencing real mud. I liked working the land and increasingly came to think of the place as my home too. When all of us were ready, we decided we'd go there for keeps. The average food item on a US grocery shelf has traveled farther than most families go on their annual vacations. True fact, fossil fuels were consumed for the food's transport, refrigeration and processing with the obvious environmental consequences. The option of getting our household's food from closer to home in Tucson seemed no better to us. The Sonoran Desert historically offered to humans baked dirt as a construction material and for eats, a corn and beans diet organized around late summer monsoons, garnished in spring with cactus fruits and wild tubers. The Hohokam and Pima were the last people to live on that land without creating an environmental overdraft. When the Spaniards arrived, they didn't rush to take up the Hohokam's diet craze. Instead, they set about working up a monumental debt, planting orange trees and alfalfa, digging wells for irrigation, with drawing millions more gallons from the water table each year than a dozen inches of annual rainfall could ever restore. Arizona is still an agricultural state even after the population boom of the late 90s, 85% of the state's water still went to thirsty crops like cotton, alfalfa, citrus, and pecan trees. Mild winters offer the opportunity to create an artificial endless summer as long as you can conjure up water and sustain a chemically induced illusion of topsoil. Living in Arizona on borrowed water made us nervous. We belong to a far-flung little community of erstwhile Tucson homesteaders, raising chickens in our yards and patches of vegetables on our own use, frequenting farmers markets to buy from Arizona farmers, trying to reduce the miles per gallon quotient of our diets in a gasaholic world. But these gardens of ours had a drinking problem. So did Arizona farms. That's a devil of a choice. Rob Mexico's water or guzzle Saudi Arabia's gas. Naturally, our first step was to buy junk food and fossil fuel. In the cinder block convenience mart, we foraged the aisles for blue corn chips and craisins. Our family's natural foods teenager scooped up a pile of energy bars big enough to pass as a retirement plan for a hamster. Our family's congenitally frugal mom shelled out two bucks for a fancy green bottle of about a nickel's worth of iced tea. As long as we were all going crazy here, we threw in some 99 cent bottles of what comes free out of drinking fountains in places like Perrier, France. In our present location, 99 cents for good water seemed like a bargain. As we gathered our loot on the counter, the sky darkened suddenly. After 200 consecutive cloudless days, you forget what it looks like when a cloud crosses the sun. We all blinked. The cashier frowned toward the plate glass window. Dang, she said, it's going to rain. 
I hope so, Stephen said. She turned her scowl from the window to Stephen, this bleach blonde guardian of gas pumps and snack foods was not amused. It better not, is all I can say. But we needed, I pointed it out. I am not one to argue with cashiers, but the desert was dying, and this was my very last minute as a Tucsonian. I hated to jinx it with bad precipitation karma. I know that's what they're saying, but I don't care. Tomorrow's my first day off in two weeks and I want to wash my car. For 300 miles, we drove that day through desperately parched Sonoran badlands, chewing our salty cashews with a peculiar guilt. We had all shared this wish in some way or another that it wouldn't rain on our day off. Thunderheads dissolved ahead of us as if honoring our compatriot's desire to wash her car as the final benediction pronounced on a dying land. In our desert, we would not see rain again. It took us five days to reach the farm. On our first full day there, we spent 10 hours mowing, clearing brush and working on the farmhouse. Too tired to cook, we headed into town for supper, opting for a diner of the Southern type that puts grits on your plate until noon and biscuits after, whether you ask for them or not. Our waitress was young and chatty, a student at the junior college nearby studying to be a nurse or else if she didn't pass the chemistry, a television broadcaster. She said she was looking forward to the weekend but smiled broadly nevertheless at the clouds gathering over the hills outside. The wooden mountainsides and velvet pastures of southwestern Virginia looked remarkably green to our desert scorched eyes, but the forests and fields were suffering here too. Drought had plagued most of the Southern United States that spring. A good crack of thunder boomed and the rain let loose just as the waitress came back to clear our plates. Listen to that, she clucked. We don't, we need it. We do, we agreed. The hay fields aren't half what they should be. Oh, let's hope it's a good long one, she said, pausing with our plates balanced on her arm, continuing to watch out the window for a good long minute and that it's not so hard that it washes everything out. It is not my intention here to lionize country wisdom over city ambition. I only submit that the children of farmers are likely to know where food comes from and that the rest of us might do well to pay attention. For our family, something turned over that evening in the diner a gas pump cashier's curse of drought was lifted by a waitress's simple agricultural craving for rain. I thought to myself, there is hope for us. If this book is not exactly an argument for reinstating food production classes in schools, and it might be, it does contain a lot of what you might learn there. From our family's gas station beginnings, we had traveled far enough to discover ways of taking charge of one's food and even knowing where it has been. This is the story of a year in which we made every attempt to feed ourselves animals and vegetables whose provenance we really knew. We tried to wring most of the petroleum out of our food chain, even if that meant giving up some things. Our highest shopping goal was to set our food from was to get our food from so close to home we'd know the person who grew it. Often that turned out to be us, as we learned to produce more of what we needed, starting with dirt, seeds, and enough knowledge to muddle through, or starting with baby animals and enough sense to refrain from naming them. This is not a how-to book, 
aimed at getting you cranking out your own food, we ourselves live in a region where every other house has a garden out back. But to many urban people, the idea of growing your food must seem as plausible as writing and conducting your own symphonies for your own personal listening pleasure. If that is your case, think of the agricultural parts of the story as a music appreciation course for food. Acquainting yourself with the composers and conductors can improve the quality of your experience. Knowing the secret natural history of potatoes, melons, or asparagus gives you a leg up on detecting whether those in your market are wholesome kids from a nearby farm or vagrants who idled away their precious youth in a box car. Knowing how foods grow is to know how and when to look for them. Such expertise is useful for certain kinds of people, namely the ones who eat no matter where they live or grocery shop. Absence of that knowledge has rendered us a nation of wary label readers, oddly uneasy in our obligate relationship with the things we eat. We call our food animals by different names after they're dead, presumably uh, sparing ourselves any vision of the beefs and the porks running around in actual hooves. Our words for unhealthy contamination, soiled or dirty, suggest that if we really knew the number one ingredient of a garden, we'd all head straight into therapy. I used to take my children's friends out to the garden to warm them up to the idea of eating vegetables, but this strategy sometimes backfired. They'd back away slowly saying, Oh man, those things touch dirt. <laughs> Adults do the same by pretending it all comes from the clean, well-lighted grocery store. We're like petulant teenagers rejecting our mother. We know we come out of her, but ew. We don't know beans about beans. Asparagus, potatoes, turkey drumsticks, you name it, we don't have a clue how the world makes it. I usually think I'm exaggerating the scope of the problem and then I'll encounter an editor at a well-known nature magazine who nixing the part of my story that refers to pineapples growing from the ground, she insisted they grow on trees. When we walked as a nation away from the land, our knowledge of food production fell away from us like dirt in a laundry soap commercial. Now, it's fair to say the majority of us don't want to be farmers, uh, see farmers, pay farmers, or hear their complaints, except as straw chewing figures in children's books, we don't quite believe in them anymore. When we give it a thought, we mostly consider the food industry to be a thing rather than a person. We obligingly give 85 cents of our every food dollar to that thing too, the processes, marketers, and transporters. And we complain about the high price of organic meats and vegetables that might send back more than three nickels per buck to the farmers. Those actual humans putting seeds in the ground, harvesting, attending livestock births, standing in the fields at dawn, casting their sh shadows upon our sustenance. There seems to be some reason we don't want to compensate or think about these hardworking people. At its heart, a genuine food culture is an affinity between people and the land that feeds them. Step one, probably, is to live on the land that feeds them or at least on the same continent, ideally the same region. 
Step two is to be able to countenance the ideas of food and dirt in the same sentence. And three is to start poking into one's supply chain to learn where things are coming from. In the spirit of this adventure, our family set out to find ourselves a real American culture of food, or at least the piece of it that worked for us, and to describe it for anyone who might be looking for something similar. This book tells the story of what we learned, or didn't, what we ate, or couldn't, and how our family was changed by one year of deliberately eating food produced in the same place where we worked, loved our neighbors, drank the water, and breathed the air. It's not at all necessary to live on a food processing farm to participate in this culture, but it is necessary to know such farms exist, understand something about what they do, and consider oneself basically in their court. This book is about those things. The story is pegged as we were to a one year cycle of how and when foods become available in a temperate climate. Because food cultures affect everyone living under the same roof, we undertook this project, both the eating and the writing as a family. Stephen's sidebars are in his words, quote, 50 cent buckets of a dollar's worth of goods. Sounds like phrase you use in Maine, on various topics I've mentioned in the narrative. Camille's essays offer a 19-year-old's perspective on the local food project, plus nutritional information, recipes, and meal plans for every season. Lily's contributions were many, including more than 50 dozen eggs and a willingness to swear off Pop-Tarts for the duration. But she was too young to sign a book contract. Will our single family decision to step off the non-sustainable food grid give a big black eye to that petroleum hungry behemoth? Keep reading, but don't hold your breath. We only knew when we started that similar choices made by many families at once were already made a difference, organic growers, farmers markets, and small ex-urban food producers now compromise the fastest growing sector of the US food economy. A lot of people at once are waking up to a troublesome truth that cheap fossil fuels we are going to run out of. Our jet age dependence on petroleum to feed our faces is a limited time only proposition. Every food calorie we presently eat has used dozens or even hundreds of fossil fuel calories in its making. Grain milling, for example, which turns corn into the ingredients of packaged foods, costs 10 calories for every one food calorie produced. That's before it gets shipped anywhere. But the by the time the children are my age, that version of dinner time will surely be an unthinkable extravagance. In closing, in Nikos Kanzatsaki's novel, Zorba the Greek, the pallid narrator frets a lot about his weaknesses of the flesh. He lies awake at night worrying about the infinite varieties of lust that call to him from this world. For example, cherries. He's way too fond of cherries. Zorba tells him, well then, I'm afraid what you must do is stand under the tree, collect a big bowl full and stuff yourself. Eat cherries like they're going out of season. That was approximately the basis of our plan, the Sorba diet. <laughs> and let me read you, there are 18 chapters in the book before we get to the final uh, uh, story to tell. 
Uh, and let me just read a couple of them to you. They do go rather seasonally. The first one is waiting for asparagus, late March. Then they go like this, springing forward, next chapter, stalking the vegetannual, molly mooching, that's April, the birds and the bees, gratitude, May, growing thrust, trust, going trust, mid-June, six impossible things before breakfast, late June, eating neighborly, late June, slow food nations, late June, zucchini larceny, hmm, that one sounds good for July, life in a red state, August, you can't run away on harvest day, September, where fish wear crowns, that's enticing for September. Smashing pumpkins, October. Celebration days, November, December. What do you eat in January? Hungry mouth, February, March. And then we get to the final chapter of the book, which is called Time Begins. So let's find out what happened after a year with this family in this fabulous experiment, we should all try once in our lives, I think. So chapter 20, time begins. Years ago, when Lily was not quite four, we were spending one of those perfect mother-daughter mornings in the flower garden. <clears throat> Excuse me. I planted pansies while she helped picking up the bugs for closer looks and not eating them all. Three is a great age. She was asking a lot of questions about creature life, I remember, because that was the day she first worked up to the big question. I don't mean sex, that's easy. She wanted to know where everything comes from. Beetles, plants, us. How did dinosaurs get on the earth and, and why did they go away? Was her reasonable starting point. How lovely it might be to invoke from my child in just one or two quotes, the inexplicable mystery. But I went to graduate school in evolutionary biology, which kind of obligates me to go into the details. So Lily and I talked about the millions and millions of years, the seaweeds and jellyfish and rabbits. I explained how most creatures have many children. Some have thousands with lots of small differences between them. These specialities, things like quick hiding or slow picky eating or just shoveling everything in can make a difference in whether the baby lives to be a grown up. The ones that survive will have children more than themselves and so on. The group slowly changes. I've always thought of this as a fine creation story, a sort of quantifiable miracle and was pleased to think I'd rendered such a complex subject comprehensible to a toddler. She sat among the flowers, pondering it. At length, she asked, Mama, did you get born or are you one of the ones that evolved from the tree primates? <laughs> At age four. Uh, I'm not eight million years old, but I am old enough to know I should never ever trust I've explained anything perfectly. Some part of the audience will always remain at large, confused or plain unconvinced. As I wind up this account, I'm weighing that. Is it possible to explain the year we had? I can tell you, we came to think of ourselves in the best way as a family of animals living in our habitat. Does that reveal the meaning of our passage? Does it explain how we're different now, even though we look the same? We are made of different stuff with new connections to our place. We have a new relationship with the weather. So what? And who cares? All stories, they say, begin in one or two ways. A stranger came to town, or else, I set out upon a journey. The rest is all just metaphor and simile. 
your high school English teacher was right. In Moby Dick, you'll know if you were half awake that the whale was not just an aquatic mammal. In our case, the heirloom turkeys are not just large birds, but symbols of a precarious hold on a vanishing honesty. The chickens are secondary protagonists. The tomatoes are allegorical. The zucchini may be just zucchini. We set out upon a journey. It seemed so ordinary on the face of things to try to do what nearly all people used to do without a second thought. But the trip surprised us many times because of all the ways a landscape can enter one's physical being. Like most of the other top heavy hominids walking around in shoes, Failing to notice the forest for the mashed trees reincarnated as our newspapers and such, I'd nearly forgotten the truest of all truths. We are what we eat. As our edible calendar approached its arbitrary conclusion, we were more than normally conscious of how everything starts over in the springtime. All the milestones that had nudged us toward the start of our Locafor year began to wink at us again. Our seedlings came up indoors, the mud ice melted, and the spice bushes in the lane covered themselves with tiny yellow pom-poms of flower. The tranquils bloomed. On April 3, the secretive asparagus began to nose up from its bed. What were we doing when the day finally came? Standing by our empty chest freezer at midnight, gnawing our last frozen brick of sliced squash, watching the clock tick down the seconds till we could run out and buy moon pies, no, I'm sorry, but the truth is so undramatic. I can't even find the day in my journal. The best I can do is to recall a moment when I understood I had kept some promise to myself, having to do with learning to see the world differently. It was a day in early April when three little trees in our yard were covered with bloom, dark pink peach blossoms, pale pink plum, and white pear, filling the space like a Japanese watercolor. The air smelled, smelled spicy. The brown pasture had turned brilliant green. From where I stood on the front porch, I could see my white winged turkeys moving slowly through their emerald sea, nibbling as they went. I pictured how I would be in another month when the grass shot up knee deep. I was struck then with a vivid fantasy of my family being in the turkey's place. Imagining what a thrill it would be to wander chest deep in one's dinner as an ordinary routine. I mean to say, I pictured us wading through piles of salad greens, breast stroking into things like tomatoes, basil, and mozzarella. I snapped out of it, recognizing this was not a very normal daydream. This was along the lines my astute children were diagnosed as wackadoo. I took myself to be a woman changed by experience. But I'd noticed the kids did change too. One day at the farmer's market, a vendor had warned us there might be some earthworms, earworms, in the corn because it was unsprayed. He pointed out a big one wriggling in the silks of one of the ears in our bag and reached in to pluck it off. Lily politely held out her hand. That was our worm, we had paid for it. She would take that protein to her chickens and in time, it would be eggs. <laughs> 
Camille used similar logic to console me after my turkeys raided the garden and took some of the nicest tomatoes. Mom, she said, you'll eat them eventually. And I did. It wasn't just our family either that it changed in a year. Food was now very much a subject of public conversation, not recipes, but issues. When we'd first dreamed of our project, we'd expected our hardest task would be to explain in the most basic terms what we were doing and why on earth we'd bother. Now our local newspaper and national ones frequently had local food feature stories on the same day. Every state had it going on, including Arizona. The food scene was feared we had left far dead. Alaska was experiencing a farmer's market boom with the Alaska Grown, quote, logo showing up on cloth shopping bags all over Anchorage. Todd Murphy's Farmer's Diner, in order to accommodate more diners, had relocated south to Ketchy Village, Vermont, near Hanover, New Hampshire. Other like-minded eateries now lay in the path of many a road trip. Hundreds of people were signing up online and reporting on their locavore month experiences. We had undertaken a life change partly as a reaction against living in a snappily named diet culture. Now, this lifestyle had its own snappy diet name, the 100 mile diet challenge. What a shock, <laughs> we were trendy. As further proof that the movement had gained significance, local eating now had some official opposition. The standard criticisms of local food as quixotic and elitist seemed to get louder as more and more of us found it affordable and utterly doable. The Christian Science Monitor even ran a story of how so much local focus could breed, quote, unhealthy provincialism. John Clark, a development specialist for where else, the World Bank, arranged, you know, argued that what are sweatshop jobs for us may be a dream job for someone else, presumably meaning those folks who earn a few dreamy bucks a day from Dole, Kraft, Unilever, or Archer Daniel Midlands, but all that goes out the window if we only buy local. He expressed concern that local food bias would lead to energy waste. As rabidly provincial consumers drove farmers to icy climes to grow bananas in hothouses. That's some creative disapproval, all right. A sure sign the local food movement was getting worrisome to food industrialists who had heretofore controlled consumer choices so handily, even when they damaged our kids' health and our neighborhoods. Shoppers were starting to show some backbone, clearly shifting certain preferences about what foods they purchased and from where. An estimated 3% of the national supply of fresh produce had moved directly from farmers to customers that year. The quote, why bother part of the question was also becoming obvious to more people. Global climate change had gone in one year from unmentionable to cover story. The end of the oil economy was now being discussed by some politicians and many economists, not just tree huggers, and Idaho survivalists, we were starting to get it. But it's also true what the strategists say about hearts and minds. You have to win them both. We will change our ways significantly as a nation, not when some law tells us we have to, remember prohibition, but when we want to. During my family's year of conscious food choices, the most important thing we had learned were all about that wanting to. Our fretful minds had started us on a project of abstinence from industrial food, but we finished it with our hearts. 
we were not counting down the days until the end because we didn't want to go back. A few days after my momentary chest deep in food fantasy, we had dinner with our friends, Sylvan and Cynthia. Sylvan grew up in the Loire Valley where local food is edible patriotism. And I sensed a kindred spirit from the way he celebrated every bite of our salad, inhaling the spice of the cut radishes and arugula. He told us that in India, it's sometimes considered a purification ritual to go home and spend a year eating everything from one place, ideally even to grow it yourself. I like this name for what we had done, a purification ritual to cultivate health and gratitude. It sounds so much better than wackadoo. Over the years since I first acquired children and a job, I've often made reference to the concern of keeping my family fed. I meant this in the same symbolic way I previously used, pre-kids, pre-respectable job, to speak of something costing a lot of bread. I was really talking about money. Now, when I say bread, I mean bread. I find that food is not symbolic of anything so much as it is real stuff. Beetroot as neighbor to my shoe, chicken as sometime companion. I once read a pioneer diary in which the Kansas wife postponed week after week, harvesting the last hen in her barren, windy yard. Quote, we need the food badly, she wrote, but I will miss the company. I've never been anywhere near that lonely, but now I can relate to the relationship. When I pick apples, I miss the way they looked on the tree. Eggplants look like light bulbs on the plant, especially the white and neon purple ones. And I observe the unplugging of their light when I toss them in a basket. My turkey hens have names now. I do know better, but couldn't help myself. At the end of March, one of my turkey mothers found her calling. She sat down on the platform nest and didn't get up again for a week, then two, then three. This was Lolita, the would-be husband stealer. <laughs> the hen who had been first to show mating behaviors and then to lay eggs. Now she was the first to begin sitting with dedication. We expunged Lolita from her record and dubbed her number one mother. Underneath the platform where she now sat earning that title, we fixed up two more nests to contain, contain the overflow. Together, the hens had now produced more than 50 eggs. While number one mother incubated about 2,000 of them, number two, three, and four were showing vague interest in the other piles. Number two had started to spend the night sitting on eggs, but still had better things to do in the daytime. Three and four were using the remaining nest the way families use a timeshare condo in Florida. But something inside the downy breast of number one had switched on. Once she settled in, I never saw her get up again, not even for a quick drink of water. With her head flattened against her body and a faraway look in her eyes, she gave herself over to maternity. I began bringing her handfuls of grain and cups of water that she slurped with desperation. I apologized for everything I'd said to her earlier. I was the free bird now, out in the sunshine as much as possible walking into the open-armed embrace of springtime. A balmy precipitation of cherry petals swirled around us as we did our garden chores. The ruddy fiddleheads of peony leaves rolled up out of the ground. The birthday garden made up of gift plants I'd received last year now surprised me like a series of unexpected phone calls. The irises bloomed, the blue fountain grass poured over the rocks. I found the yellow lady's slipper blossoms when I was weeding under the maple. 
One friend had given me 50 tulip bulbs, one for each of my years, which we planted in a long trail down the driveway. Now they were popping up with flaming redheads or slender stalks like candles on a birthday cake. The groundhog that dug up some bulbs over the winter had taken a few years off. I would try to remain grateful to the groundhog later on when he was eating my beans. Spring is made of solid 14 karat gratitude, the reward for the long wait. Every religious tradition from the Northern Hemisphere honors some form of April hallelujah, for this is a season of exquisite redemption a slam bang return to joy after a season of cold second thoughts. Our personal hallelujah was the return of good fresh food. Nobody in our household was dying for a moon pie, but we'd missed crisp things more than we'd realized. Starting the cycle again was a heady prospect, cutting asparagus, hunting morels, harvesting tender spinach and chard. We'd made it. Did our year go the way we had expected? It's hard to say. We weren't thinking every minute about food as our family life was occupied front and center by so many other things. Devastating illnesses had darkened several doors in our close family. We'd sent a daughter off to college and missed her company and her cooking. In our special way of eating, it seemed imposing at first. Gradually, it was just dinner the spontaneous background of family time as we met our fortunes one day, one telephone call, one hospital visit, wedding, funeral, spelling bee, and birthday party, one at a time. It caused us to take more notice of food traditions of all kinds, the candy-driven school discipline program, the overwhelming brace of covered dishes that attend a death in the family. But in the main, our banana free life was now just our life. So much so, in fact, I sometimes felt myself a bit startled to run across things like bananas in other people's kitchens, like discovering a pair of Manilo Blahnik sandals in the lettuce bed very nice, I'm sure, just a little but extravagant for our kind. We pressed ourselves to pronounce some verdicts on our year. Our planning and putting by for the winter had passed muster, as we still had pesto and vegetables in our freezer to last comfortably till the abundances of June. We overplanted squash, could have used more garlic, but had enough of everything to stay happy. The website of the local eating Vancouver couple said they had ended their year 15 pounds lighter, despite what they described as a lot of potatoes. Whereas we all weighed out of the year right about where we'd weighed in and hoped to remain, except for Lily who had gained 12 pounds and grown nearly five inches. Obviously, we never went hungry, and you can't raise that much good kid on potatoes alone. The Canadians had been purists, though, and really we weren't. We'd maintained those emergency rations of mac and cheese, and anyone giving up coffee gets a medal we weren't even in the running for. But frankly, one year in which no high fructose corn syrup crosses my threshold is pure enough for me. Our plan to make everything from scratch had pushed us into a lot of great learning experiences. In some cases, what we learned was that it was too much trouble for every day. Homemade pasta really is better, but we will always buy it most of the time and save the big pasta cranking events for dinner parties. Hard cheeses are hard. I never did try the French class mayonnaise recipe. I'd always managed or imagined to some irrational moment that I would learn to make apple cider and vinegar, but happily submitted to realism when I located professionals nearby doing these things very well. On the other hand, making our daily bread, soft cheeses and yogurt had become so routine, we now prepared them in minutes without a recipe. Altered routines were really the heart of what we'd gained. 
we'd learned that many aisles of our supermarket offered us nothing local. So we didn't even push our carts down those. Frozen foods, canned goods, soft drinks, yes, that's a whole aisle. Just grab the Virginia dairy products and organic flour and get out was our motto before we started coveting thy neighbor's goods. A person can completely forget about lemons and kiwis once the near occasion is removed. As successful as our sleuthing into local markets had been, we never did find good local wheat products or seafood. I was definitely looking forward to some non-local splurges in the coming months, wild caught Alaskan salmon and bay scallops and portobellos, hooray. In moderation, of course, I had a much better sense of my options now and could try for balance. Buying one bottle of Virginia wine, for example, for every import. The biggest shock of our year came when we added up the tab. We'd fed ourselves organically and pretty splendidly, we thought, on about 50 cents per family member per meal probably less than I spend in the year when I qualified for food stamps. Of course, I now had the luxury of land for growing food to supplement our purchases, but it wasn't a lot of land. 3,524 square feet of tilled beds gave us all of our produce. That's a 40 by 20 foot a square foot of uh, a 20 foot spread per person. It felt a big bit bigger when we were reading it. <laughs> we appreciate our farm's wooded mountainsides for hiking and the rare morale foray and for our household water supply. But in the main, one doesn't eat a nature preserve. Adding up the land occupied by our fruit trees, berry bushes, and the pasture grazed by our poultry brings our land use total for nutritional support to about a quarter of an acre. Still, a modest allotment. Our main off-farm purchases for the year were organic grain for animal feed and the 300 pounds of flour required for our daily bread. To put this in perspective, a good wheat field yields 1,600 pounds of flour per acre. In total, for our grain and flour pastured meats and goods from the farmer's market and our own produce, our family's food footprint for the year was probably around one acre. By contrast, current nutritional consumption in the US requires an average of 1.2 cultivated acres for every citizen, 4.8 acres for a family of four, among other things, it takes space to grow corn syrup for that hypothetical family's 219 gallons of soda. These estimates become more meaningful when placed next to another prediction. In 2050, the amount of US farmland available per citizen will be only 0.6 acres. By the numbers, the hypothetical family has changed in the cards by any measure, ours had discovered a way of eating that was more resourceful than I ever could have predicted. In the coming year, I decided I would plant fewer tomatoes and more flowers. If we didn't have quite such a big garden, if we took a vacation to the beach this summer, we'd do that thanks to our friends at the farmer's market. The point of being dedicated locavores for some prescribed length of time, I now understand, is to internalize a trust in one's own food stock. It's natural to get panicky right off the bat, freaking out about January and salad, thinking we could never ever do it, but we did. Without rationing, skipping a meal, buying a corn-fed Midwestern burger, or breaking our vows of exclusivity with local produce. We lived inside our own territory for one good year of food life. I can't exactly explain what we're looking for, I told our guests, feeling like a particularly and perfectly idiotic guide. Your eye kind of has to learn for itself. 
We were back in old Charlie's lot, scanning the dry leaf colored ground of dry, of dry leaf colored mushrooms. Stephen found the first patch, a trim tilted at coy angles like garden gnomes. We all stood staring, trying to fix our vision. The color, the shape, the size, everything about a morale resembles a curled leaf lying on the ground about a million of its kind. Even so, the brain perceives dimly at first and then after practice with a will a willingly and weirdly trenchant efficiency. You spot them before you've seen them. We've gone the whole cycle, raising our mail order hatchlings into the most senior democratic demographic of American turkeys. Now, just after our first birthday, one of the nation's eldest had begun its newest. Only a few times in my life have I actually seen lives began and never had I held to my palm that miracle caught in the act. The chick that had come out now dived back into the feather security blanket, disappear disappearing completely under mom, but we kept staring. We couldn't help it. She glared back. I suppose she couldn't help that either. After another moment, a whole crowd of little black eyes appeared under their mother's wing. Two, four, six, eight, ten. It's hard to explain how irrationally proud I felt of our success, their success, a mother's and, in his clumsy way, a father's too, but most of all these creatures who had pe pecked themselves heroically into the bright wide world to give this life a go. Lily and I backed away and slipped out of the turkey coop into the grain room. I thought of that day when I tried to explain to Lily the beginnings of everything. However, I might have bungled it. I hadn't undone for her the beautiful mystery. That part tells itself. Crazed and giddy, there in the dusty barn, we held hands and danced. Babies. That was all, and that was enough. A nest full of little ding-dongs, and time begins once more. <laughs> and thus, the end of Barbara's marvelous book, and I leave it to you to fill in the blanks, reading all 18 of the small chapters between. Each one is a, each one is a chapter of discovery. Uh, as you won't be surprised to hear. I'd like to add that at the end of the book, uh, Barbara also includes a list of 39 agencies and organizations uh, from sustainable agricultural uh, agriculture and farming, food policy, consumer uh, advocacy, local food, eating, and food security. So she, and this published in 2007, added on to in 2017, uh, but things have changed, thank goodness, and going in hopefully the right direction. Animal, vegetable, miracle. <laughs> Barbara Kingsolver, she and her family discovered a whole new way of life and how proud they were of that one year. And I'm sure continue it to this day. Thank you very much for listening with me today and staying tuned. I hope you enjoyed it. And another salute to the Camden Garden Club and their annual February efforts to keep us posted on all things horticulturally. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about next week's uh, program, if I may. Uh, you probably have it on your calendar, uh, those of you who live in Camden, Rockland and the neighborhood, uh, that uh, February 22 is a big day for us in Maine and Rockland, Rockport. And that is the birthday of Edna St. Vincent Millay, of course. Edna St. Vincent Millay was born on the 22nd of February and on the 19th of February, a little in advance, next Friday, we're going to do a salute to Edna St. Vincent Millay. There are two great salutes happening, ours first on Friday, and next on Saturday, uh, that'll be obviously the 19th, 
at the Farnsworth Museum in conjunction with the Edna St. Vincent Millay Society, um, an annual event that uh, is just a marvelous event with the poetry of our uh, dear local lady who made good. So in order not to duplicate those, we're going to take a little bit of a different slant at Edna St. Vincent Millay. And I have that feeling from this quote that I caught along the way when I was doing my research. And it's a quote here, if F. Scott Fitzgerald was the hero of the jazz age, Edna St. Vincent Millay, as flamboyant in her love affairs as she was in her art, was the heroine. Hmm, the heroine of the jazz age. Edna St. Vincent Millay. We're going to depend on lots of tidbits from the wonderful book by Nancy Milford called Savage Beauty, The Life of Edna St. Vincent Millay. But I'm going to weave in a few unexpected things actually. For example, Edna St. Vincent Millay wrote a play, Aria de Capo. Edna St. Vincent Millay also wrote a document uh, there are no islands anymore, lines written in passion and in deep concern for England, France, and my own country. This is 1940, in her days as a pacifist of the World War. Of the World War. So I'm going to try to come up with some things that will augment everything that the Farnsworth will be doing mostly with the poetry, the beautiful poetry of Edna St. Vincent Millay. So we're going to take a look at another angle of our local daughter, uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay. I hope you'll join me for that next week. I think I might be able to unearth some interesting tidbits of the jazz age. I'd like to thank you for watching today. Thank you very much. If, uh, if you enjoyed this video, please uh, like it uh, or consider uh, sharing it actually with your friends. Also, please feel free to leave a comment uh, or as one gentleman did last week, uh, the name of a book or an author that you'd like us to feature on our program. I also encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel uh, to stay on top of the great variety of programs uh, that un unfold at our public library. Again, thank you so much for listening in. Hopefully you'll learn something and uh, please send me your name and number if I can depend on you to help with my garden this summer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the winter and look forward to the spring as much as I do. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. <laughs>